We will continue with uh, the module 7. As you know, we have been covering various chapters in module 7. As a recap, I would like to inform you that we are looking at component assembly, materials for assembly. When we say assembly, we have looked at plated through hole component assembly, surface mount device assembly and including advanced packages like BGA or CSP, uh, QFN and the like. Now, flip chip if you consider as a chip connection choice not as a package, we have seen earlier how such uh, interconnects can be generated or how you can connect a flip chip on a printed circuit board. Now, flip chip normally comes into a BGA package and please remember we have mentioned this quite a few times that if you are using flip chip, it is not a package, it is a chip connection choice. So, we have seen BGA how they are assembled on an organic substrate that is a printed circuit board and we have also seen in the few uh, lectures before the joining methods in electronics. That means, we have seen how to establish a reliable connection in electronics for plated through hole assembly, surface mount devices and BGA. In fact, we have also seen various video highlights uh, covering these aspects. Now, today we will shift our focus to some very important aspects governing uh, assessment, quality assessment of a finished or assembled printed wiring board. So, the areas that I will cover today will be failures library and also looking at thermal profile of an assembly process. Typically today we are using reflow soldering for majority of the surface mount devices. So, we will focus on thermal profile of let us say a reflow process because as I repeat if you look at a printed circuit board for a mobile application you will see almost 90 percent of the board are surface mount devices today and it includes BGA components. There may be about 5 percent through hole components because of non availability in the SMD sector and you can also have about 5 percent through hole components in the form of connectors or some kind of a electromechanical device and so on. So, this is the very general trend today and we look at from this perspective. We will also look at the current situation of using soldering material for joining components to the interconnect substrate and we will focus on lead free components because today as you know there is a huge legislation um, coming for handling or choosing materials especially in the form of eliminating lead. So, this will be the basis for our uh, lecture today. We have in the previous class covered a couple of these, uh, we will uh, go through them once again. The failures library that I am going to list today will cover some of the very common defects that can be observed when you do a surface mount um, assembly practice. In the industry, these have to be avoided because you are looking at very high percentage yield. Typically, you want 99 percent yield and the failures can come from various sources. It could be from the component which means selection of components. It could be from the printed circuit board that has been realized for this particular um, process. 
and it could be from the process parameters that you have used for assembling the components onto the printed circuit board. So, we will go through the some of these um, very important aspects and very common defects have been presented here. So, that when you try to assemble you might encounter with these kind of defects or difficulties. So, you need to be aware of some of the problems. The first thing which I want to mention is insufficient solder or no solder. As you can see from this picture here, um, there is a fairly very good interconnect over here, joining method has been um, well established. But if you look at this particular joint of a chip um, component, you can see there is obviously no solder or in some cases you would see insufficient solder. Now, what does this mean? Insufficient solder will induce risk of joint failure. We have seen that um, an electrical uh, spike could result in a mechanical failure that means, the component could break or it could lead to a solder joint fatigue or solder joint failure. Similarly, thermal issues, heating up of a chip component or an active device could result in a solder joint failure. Now, this kind of failure what we are seeing here in this slide is a result of a poor process control, right. So, you can see during the process a particular component or a few components if you carefully analyze you would see that the solder material here is comparatively less uh, compared to the other parts of the board. Now, what does this mean? This will induce risk of joint failure during mechanical and thermal stress on the PCB. Obviously, when a PCB is powered up, okay, the entire board is powered up and there will be thermal cycling, thermal stress will be built up on the devices and your solder joint typically will have to bear the thermal shock. But because there is insufficient solder, um, this could result in a open and eventually a failure. Now, how do you control this? The important area where you would need to control is the dispensing process of the solder paste. Remember, you are dispensing solder paste using stencil or screen printing better done by stencil printing using uh, stainless steel uh, stencils. Now, the stencil could be blocked for some reason because either you have done too much of printing on that particular stencil, the solder paste could have dried and you have not really cared to clean the openings on the stencil. So, that the solder paste flow onto the PCB is um, continuous and uh, consistent. Therefore, stencil block could be one major reason um, that you should think about when you look at this kind of failure. So, in such cases you ensure that the stencil or screen printing process is perfect. How do you do that? You clean the stencil with the appropriate uh, cleaning material and then do not allow to dry the solder paste on the stencil printer. So, the technician by experience uh, would not do that. Once the process is over and if there is a gap between this printing batch and the next, obviously you have to keep the stencil and the work table of the stencil printer fairly clean enough, so that the material does not dry. After that the remedy is in case you have encountered such a problem, you have to do a rework and you have to remove the component and then remount the component manually. Obviously, in a board of 100 chip components and if about 5 or 6 are to be replaced, then you have to go in for a manual rework. That will be uh, the best process and the best option that you have. Now, the next failure that you are going to see is tombstoning and or skewing. Um, typically, you would observe one of these 
very rarely you would observe all of these together. It is also called the Manhattan effect. Uh, basically, as you look at this picture here, you can see that there is a chip uh, capacitor and these are the two pads, copper pads on which the solder paste has been dispensed and your component has been placed prior to reflow soldering process. Now, in this picture you can see that one component has lifted from the pad of the printed circuit board and then it has skewed a bit and in the other case you can see that it has lifted fully and it is standing as a tombstone. Hence the name tombstoning effect or skewing effect. Now this can be observed during the reflow process where the chip components are lifted and stand on one end of the terminal and a variation of this as I told you is the skewing uh, that you see. And how is this caused? It is caused by unequal soldering conditions on the two solder joints uh, that the chip component is supposed to be placed on and then soldered perfectly. This has happened either due to different melting temperatures on let us say pad 1 and pad 2 okay, and also different times that you have given for the reflow process or the time taken for the solder material that you have dispensed on the board to melt. This time has been unequal on the different pads. Now this could also be due to uh, different volume of solder paste that you have dispensed. Now if you recall solder paste is dispensed either by syringe dispensing okay for small prototyping you can do manually and that is where the problem comes. If you do manual solder paste dispense using a syringe you tend to um, have unequal volumes on the pad and therefore these kind of problems could typically be when you do manual syringe dispensing of the solder paste. Now unequal volumes can come from stencil printing also and like we have seen in the previous slide that could be corrected by keeping the stencil clean and keeping the pores or the openings on the stencil uh, fairly clean enough after let us say every 500 prints or 1000 prints to make sure that the correct volume is dispensed onto the board. In some cases reflow in nitrogen atmosphere has seen uh, to be the main reason for this phenomenon to occur. Now why nitrogen atmosphere? Normally reflow soldering is done in air that means your reflow oven uh, has air convection based and there will be air circulation okay. and typically the solder paste gets activated well in air. Now there are certain solder paste material uh, which is recommended to be done in nitrogen um, basically because of the composition of the solvent and other components of the solder paste. But then the thermal profile is slightly different for a reflow process in nitrogen atmosphere and that which is done in air. Now air acts as a catalyst and you could expect much better activation of the solder paste when you do in air rather than in nitrogen. Therefore, this um, point of getting different melting temperatures and time of melting could be due to poor inactivation in the zone uh, which is basically nitrogen and therefore this could be one of the reasons for looking at these kind of defects like tombstoning and skewing. And typically what you see here in the point that I have mentioned at the bottom and if you relate it to the figure here, the force T4 which actually lifts the component from the base of the pad is very much larger compared to the force exhibited by the, the solder paste at this end. Then the solder paste, the 
force exhibited by this terminal snub stub on the other pad and then the weight of the component. Therefore, what has happened basically here is this solder paste has um, got activated much faster. The melting temperatures uh, have been attained in a much lesser time compared to this pad and the solder paste and therefore, um, this solder paste here by surface tension has pulled the component towards its side and uh, it is not at all attached to this pad. Okay. So, typically you will see a very small variation in the melting temperatures okay. and if this entire solder paste here at this point is not molten then the surface tension uh, is not available uh, or not exhibited by the solder paste to hold the component terminal towards its end and that is one of the reasons why you see tombstoning taking place. So, having seen this problem how are you going to correct it? Ensure that the pad layout is correct okay. especially there are pad designs available for wave soldering and reflow soldering. So, you have to make sure that you use the right pad size for reflow soldering process for the components that you have chosen. Now, it is not necessary to have a very large area for chip components that will lead to a larger solder paste um, being dispensed and you will have thermal uh, profile to be adjusted to suit that kind of a situation. Ensure that you have minimum pad size for the chip component and to make sure that the minimum solder paste is dispensed. Now, once that is done from the design stage, the next thing that you have to check is the thermal profile for the reflow soldering process and make sure that the melting temperatures um, are attained in a fairly quick time without too much of uh, exposure to the component and then you also have to look at the component density on the PCB as a whole. So, thermal profiling becomes very important to avoid these kind of defects and also you need to understand the components of the solder paste material. The third one is excess solder. Here you can see in the picture uh, different defects. You can see here too much of solder material, there is too much of solder there on the component. So, there is too much solder alloy than required for the joint. This condition can also cause a mechanical stress on the component as well as the joint. Too much of solder is also a problem. So, study the pad layout, use the pad size correctly and use suitable um, volume of the solder paste material. If you are using wave soldering, this could be a common problem. Okay. So, what you are seeing is typically if your pad size is very large then there will be a larger wave drag from the wave soldering process. So, you have to avoid that. Okay. So, from in your design you must first understand whether your board is going for wave soldering or reflow soldering and accordingly do the layout. And because you can see here typically what would have happened here is the copper pad area is very large. Okay and it has taken too much of um, solder during the wave soldering process and that is why you see excess solder. Now, excess solder also can create problems in component swim, they are not attached in their proper coordinates and you can see here in this particular process or figure, you can see a large volume uh, uh, of material that is the solder material has been dragged and luckily here there is no bridging between the components. The excess solder has been taken by an additional pad that you have designed in your layout. So, this is a very apt process, a correct process, a correct design that is um, meant for taking care 
of such errors or defects during assembly. The next failure is solder bridging. You can see in this figure here there is solder bridging that means adjacent terminals have too much solder and they short each other because of solder present in between pins or terminals. This could be seen in BGA, it could be seen in QFP components um, and if components are placed close to each other without proper design considerations then you can see solder bridging. Now this is a defect seen as a mechanical bridge formed by the solder alloy whatever solder material you are using after soldering and resulting in an electrical shot. It can be seen in wave soldering, it can also be seen in reflow soldering process. So you have to observe this defect very carefully especially in fine pitch components. So if you are using QFPs okay, and if the pitch is um, less than 0.65 mm and very uh, closely watch in 0 0.5, 0 0.35 mm, you will see there are chances for solder bridging. Therefore, your thermal profiling and again the quantum of solder paste that you are going to dispense has to be well measured. So, design considerations are uh, clearly very important in manufacturing. Now, how do you uh, rectify this? Check screen printing process during reflow soldering process that is if the solder paste is smearing, if there is a lump formation, excessive solder paste, if there are contaminants like dirt, hair or other for foreign particles if they are attached onto the PCB and if you have not taken care of during placement of the component then there is very good chance that they will attach itself, attach themselves to the solder paste material and that could be one of the reasons for the formation of the solder bridge. So make sure that the work is done in a clean atmosphere and uh, you make sure that the technicians and personnel do not uh, uh, work with uh, materials that are contaminated especially the cleaning solutions or the cleaning uh, uh, materials that are being used the brushes and so on which are normally used to clean the boards and then the solder paste itself should be of very good quality. In wave soldering how does this happen? It could be due to poor orientation of the component and that could be avoided by using solder thieves which we have seen in the previous slide. This is typically called a solder thieve which pulls out the excess solder from the last terminal of a QFP. So this is about solder bridging. So here as you can see this is the figure that I was referring to. Now next defect is missing component as you can see here there is supposed to be a component here but that is missing. Now the reasons could be very simple when you are doing an automated pick and place this normally does not occur when you do small volume prototyping manual placement. Okay. But normally encountered with high speed pick and place machine that is used for placement of a large number of components and those large number of components could be very light uh, chip components. Now when you place a component uh, either by the automated machine or manually you are placing it on a solder paste. Now the solder paste is supposed to have some kind of a tackiness to hold the component. So in this case typically if you troubleshoot you could probably think at that this solder paste does not contain enough adhesive to hold the component. Remember in a pick and place machine the speeds are very high. Okay. And normally the chip and play, uh, pick and place um, nozzle or the head does not position your component on the coordinates. It actually comes to the coordinate and then actually drops the component and the component by its weight has to sit on the solder paste and the solder paste with its adhesive component 
should hold the uh, package until it glows for reflow soldering process. In between there is a tacky cure process that is you can do it at room temperature or at very low temperatures in the oven it, you can do a tacky cure. But then before it goes for a reflow processing um, the component should not move. Okay. So, misalignment of component could also happen uh, when you consider these kind of uh, problems with solder paste material. The other thing is when you work with automated uh, machines uh, the component could have been blown out during the reflow soldering. Uh, again in a reflow if there is a convection air the component is probably displaced because of the air uh, inside the reflow machine. So, again it emphasizes the fact that reflow soldering process when you use a solder paste the solder paste should have good tackiness. So, how do you take care of these kind of defects um, that should not uh, be constantly seen in your boards uh, for automated uh, workplaces? Look at the placement speed, look at the PCB support and look at the solder paste condition. All these things I have just now um, emphasized especially the solder paste, uh, the PCB support comes from the basic uh, equipment loading and the placement speed you have to take care of in the pick and place machine. All of these can be controlled well, it could be monitored well by an experienced technician and if you are uh, looking at uh, good ethics of working and good um, environment for working this could be avoided. The other library um, illustration that I would like to show is a defect known as solder beads. Here you can see there is a package and you can see the uh, footprint and in between you can see there is a solder bead. Now could this be a defect? Yes, if this pitch is very small and if there is a bead that you have noticed or not noticed uh, and you think it is not going to harm the package or the board then you are wrong because this could be a very important um, seed point for um, corrosion. Uh, it could damage the package, it could result in short over time because of some kind of a whisker formation or it could contaminate the surface of the board and form uh, electrochemical um, uh, connection bridge between adjacent pads or tracks and so on. And it could also result in um, the solder, so there is a solder mask on the board, but uh, a, a lump of a solder bead which is typically tin lead or even if you take lead free materials. Uh, they could be harmful in terms of um, decomposition and if the board is subject to certain kind of a thermal stress or thermal cycling uh, they get uh, decomposed and the, the degassing or the solvents or the other uh, the chemicals from the solder alloy could damage the surface of the board eventually leading into some kind of a uh, shot between very close tracks or pads. So, beads are seen on the board after reflow process. How has this happened? The solder paste has um, the solvents in the solder paste have boiled or evaporated because you have set a thermal profile which is absolutely wrong you have done a very fast preheating um, and then it has outgassed. All the material has sputtered and during the sputtering process the solder bead has been thrown out close to the package or under the package or close to a copper pad. Okay. So, outgassing of solvents due to th uh, poor thermal profile uh, from the solder paste material during reflow is one of the main reasons for solder bead formation. Now again I have to repeat that you have to do a very good thermal profiling. So, I am going to show later 
uh, in this lecture what is a thermal profile and how do you take care of and study thermal profile for different segments. So, in this case you must know what is the content in a solder paste, what kind of solvents are there, do you do gradual heating to remove the solvents and here you can see in this picture a solder paste has been dispensed on pads and even before attachment of the component you can see they are not adhering onto the copper pad. Okay. You can see bead formation already because at room temperature or during tacky cure you can see that the solvents have gone and the solder paste has disintegrated. It is uh, a material that has lost its shelf life or during the synthesis of the solder paste the media has not been properly um, utilized in holding all the um, solder paste material that is the conductive material together that is a very key issue in the synthesis of solder paste. So, thermal profiling plus the poor quality of solder paste could lead to solder beads. The other defect is voiding, voiding you can see here this is a void in a very good otherwise very good um, solder joint. Voiding is caused by outgassing of solvents in the solder. So, typically you can assume that this is a very good joint formed, but unfortunately uh, there is a defect which has been caused by outgassing of the solvent in the solder uh, paste material and that has created a void. Flux material could be the reason for this defect, flux is present in the solder paste as you know and poor thermal profiling for such solder paste can cause voids. Here again you should not um, approach the reflow temperature fairly fast, it has to be very gradual. You have to look at the substrate material Tg, you have to look at what solvents are being used, what binder is used and what flux material is used and accordingly slowly remove these solvents uh, or evaporate the solvents very gradually. If you give a, a very high heat um, rate of heating in the thermal profile that you have generated then the solvents could just bubble out okay, and the resulting outgassing could create voids. So, soaking zone as we call it in the thermal profiling has to be increased. So, you have to activate the board very slowly or you can keep it activated for a longer time in the soaking zone before you go to a reflow zone. Also increase the preheat time of the board so that your copper pad and the substrate are nicely activated and then it next goes into the soaking zone where the solder paste material and the flux material are activated gradually. So, in such cases if you think that air um, is a deterrent and you can probably work with nitrogen atmosphere so that you can control uh, these kind of issues. Now, you can see flipped component here this is supposed to be at the bottom, this side is supposed to be at the bottom. So, it is uh, a flipped component this is a defect wrong placement upside down component mostly seen in resistor placement process. Now, a flip chip capacitor may not be recognizable and may not cause problems because I think uh, I have mentioned that um, in most cases chip capacitors do not have any labels. Uh, so, it is very important that you look at the uh, packaging material or the uh, reel where the markings are done on the outside of the tape to recognize what the capacitor uh, value and the case form is. Now, typically if you look at it, it may not cause a major problem, but there will be less insulation between the component and the track and this could be an issue if you have a flipped component, uh, especially in the case of resistors. Now, rework on the component if you want to do, 
you have to manually desolder the material or the package and then um, solder it again with a new component. Okay. This is the only solution for replacing a flipped component. Now, the other failure is a shifted component and tantalum outgassing. Here you can see there is a large capacitor, tantalum capacitor and here you can see a small component. Now, the solder paste has been dispensed, reflow has been um, initiated. During the reflow process, the component here you see has been shifted from its uh, footprint due to outgassing of um, gases from this particular large tantalum capacitor. The reason is simple, the capacitor has absorbed moisture uh, during its storage period. Now, what you have done is you have directly used the component without doing a preheating and then during the preheating of the soldering process, the water um, is being removed from the component during the heating process. There is uh, outburst of the gases, there is outgassing and this is so powerful that it displaces the nearby small component. How does it displace? Because the small component is actually swimming in the solder paste during the reflow process before it is cooled. So, it is very easy to displace the nearby component if it is lightweight. So, low temperature baking of certain components is highly recommended uh, for uh, these kind of outgassing uh, defects. And plastic casings of packages do absorb moisture. So, if you look at the data sheet of packages, you have to necessarily look at this problem because this is a global um, phenomenon. Many defects have been seen due to moisture absorption by packages um, and especially uh, large uh, packages like this capacitor. Uh, therefore, you have to do a pre-baking before you actually uh, send them out to a reflow soldering process. Now, the other failure that we would like to highlight here is a BGA joint failure. Now, just like other components, BGA will have failure. The difficulty with observing BGA failure is that it is an area array package. The connections are at the bottom of the package, right. So, it is an array of solder ball as you can see here. You have to use an x-ray picture of a soldered BGA device to understand what kind of defects are there. Now, if there is a thermal stress built on a BGA during the working of the board, you have to look at and if you observed a defect and you are sure about that the BGA has got a defect, then you have to use an x-ray uh, picture, x-ray micrograph and see the defect whether there is a cracking of the die under the BGA or if there is a shorting between two adjacent solder balls or some other defect. So, uh, we look at a couple of defects here in this particular slide. So, what you are seeing here is an x-ray of a BGA that has been soldered. Some areas are soldered well. So, these are highly um, perfect. Some of the areas you can see here, they are shorted. Okay. So, this is a short. This is not accepted. In some cases, you can see there is insufficient solder compared to the normal areas. This is a normal area. You can see here at the center, there is insufficient solder. Now, so these are major defects in this particular uh, view graph that you are seeing here. Either the solder paste has not been dispensed properly if you are using solder paste to attach a BGA. If you have not used additional solder paste for attaching a BGA, that means you are using the BGA solder ball itself to reflow and then form an interconnect uh, uh, to the board, then this could be due to a delamination or popcorning effect as you call it, very common in BGAs. Again, this is due to 
the plastic body of the BGA absorbing moisture okay epoxy as you know is well known for its um, moisture absorption and before uh, you are doing the process you have to do a pre bake if you have not done a pre break pre bake then you will see this kind of a popcorning effect okay so avoid bga outgassing because it is very difficult to desolder a bga and then repair at that particular site it is very easy to do um, a repair for a through hole component or an smd device but if it is a large pin count bga then you have to spend a lot of time on reworking the device so check the solder paste material bga ball material remove moisture by pre baking or setting a thermal profile for more preheating times so if you have not done pre baking to be on the safe side in your thermal profile spend more time uh, for the board to be in a pre bake area and then go into a soaking zone where the solder paste gets activated and then go to the reflow zone where you attain peak uh, soldering temperatures. So these are some of the defects that we have seen. There are many such defects but due to lack of time we will um, conclude with this and at any process after the assembly is done you have to do inspection and testing. This is a key area in board assembly cycle special test pads for different nets on the board have to be provided while designing for in circuit testing because just like you did a bare board testing for the finished bare board you have to do uh, a testing for assembled boards to see that your assembled process or your assembly using a particular solder material or a reflow or a wave soldering has been done to perfection. So here because there are different profiles of components on the board um, you have to use flying probe testers. So typically this will be um, various probes that are available in the equipment and that will go net by net okay, based on your CAD information and then look at interconnection or connectivity. Okay. So you will have one probe stick um, stationed in the net in a particular pad and then you will see the various other probes going through and completing the net and giving you information about the shots or open in that particular uh, board after the assembly process is over. So you can troubleshoot if there are any problems. Now typically for flying probe testers uh, you should have double sided probing, unrestricted use of probes, multiple guards, high fault coverage, high speed and productivity should be there because in large volume uh, you cannot waste time on just testing and fast automated programming methods are normally available in current equipments. Okay. So the, the question is here again it emphasizes the need for looking at designers have to look at design for testability. So have your design in such a way that your boards can be tested by automated test equipment um, using your CAD data or the layout data. Okay. So that you spend minimum time for testing although testing is very critical. Um, this could also go in for an advanced uh, test procedures where you look at electrical issues, electrical parameters. So although you would have done simulation before, uh, testing of a finished assembled board becomes a very integral part of um, packaging. So that completes the assembly process. We will now look at some specific points regarding the soldering process using tin lead, tin and lead free materials. Firstly, we look at tin only. Suppose you are doing tin only soldering process. What does tin do? It protects copper. It provides a very good wetting surface for the copper and it provides a very good wetting surface for your component 
to get attached and provide a reliable joint. The next thing is tin provides a reasonable amount of solderability. It has been well established for over the years and people have understood uh, tin very much in electronics as a soldering material. Now, if you use tin alone, the finish is rather poor, it is kind of a dull okay, compared to a tin lead finish. Tin lead finish is usually very bright, very attractive and aesthetic in terms of the color. But if you use tin only, which normally you use in prototyping small volume, you will get a very poor finish. You can do simple immersion plating for tin on copper, um, very less expensive. Now, when you want to use uh, lead free soldering, in that case tin will be the main ingredient. Okay. Normally, we are now used to tin lead as a major alloy in electronics. Now, if you want to remove the lead, then tin becomes a major alloying element along with other materials like silver, copper, bismuth, indium uh, and so on, which you are going to see shortly. So, it will be used along with copper, silver, indium, bismuth, antimony and then tin is a major component in electronic soldering today undisputed and the only problem with tin which has been noticed for years now has been that if you use tin alone you see viscous it is a defect um, when it is used alone without alloying. So, tin viscous are this is another defect just we have as we have seen defects during the reflow soldering process this defect will be seen let us say a year after the board has been assembled or 2 years, 3 years after the board has been uh, assembled, utilized and in operation. Okay. So, it is a very slow phenomenon and I will explain to you what tin whisker is and how it looks like. See here this picture here, um, this has been taken from uh, Kurt Jacobson who wrote an article in the Guardian. Um, 3rd April 2008. This is from uh, this uh, newspaper that this picture has been taken. It gives a very good uh, illustration or um, an example of how tin whiskers. This is a micrograph. Okay. It is a micrograph of tin whisker. You can see there are two tracks um, and you can see thin lines of tin uh, from one end of the board or the interconnect spreading slowly and contacting the other end resulting in a shot. So, tin whiskers can create major problems, it can create a large uh, spark to be formed, it can create an arc it can create a quick shot and destroy the uh, complete PCB um, because of this um, shorting and they are different from dendrites. If you are uh, aware of this term dendrites which you normally see in zinc plated surfaces, tin whiskers are normally seen in tin plated surfaces. So, here in PCB this particular phenomenon that you are seeing here in this illustration or micrograph is an example of copper plated with tin. Okay. There is no other intermediate interface and the components have been soldered on tin surface, which means you are providing more tin over time and uh, these whiskers are formed due to various factors which I will explain shortly. Uh, the physical uh, parameters of these tin whiskers typically they can grow up to 10 mm, but typically about 1 to 2 mm very fast diameters ranging from 10 to 150 microns. They are caused by residual stresses within the tin plating. Okay. So, in a tin plating finish if you create a nick or a scratch okay, post process and that will be a very good source 
for tin whiskers to grow because that is something kind of a um, an area where the stresses could be released from the tin thickness that you have plated. Then these whiskers are basically due to the intermetallic growth that your ex, uh, that it tin exhibits um, from the copper surface. So, scratches or nicks in the plating surface will induce the whiskers could be the starting point uh, for formation of whiskers and these whiskers grow typically 1 to 2 mm per year kind of a thing. And this is also caused by CTE mismatch that is coefficient of thermal expansion mismatch between the plated surface and the base. Okay. So, growth rate is uh, 0 0.03 to 0 0.9 mm per year that is almost 1 mm per year and typically not observed immediately, but during the working of the product um, one fine day you find a defect in the product and if you troubleshoot and see on if it is a tin plated board you can definitely expect tin whiskers. So, it has a high risk of component solder joint shorting and the best thing is to avoid pure tin plating at all cost um, or lessen the percentage of tin in that alloy. And it could also come from contamination of the water used that is in the plating process or cleaning process uh, and also the atmosphere in which it is stored or used. Okay. The PCB could be used in very corrosive atmosphere um, because of the product that is being used in that application. And um, there is a very interesting story about tin whiskers uh, because I want to just tell you how very important it is to handle materials. Okay. Tin lead is very safe, but because we are removing lead now because of ROHS legislation, you are going to use tin in conjunction with other materials which is safe, but if we use large percentage of tin, uh, you are going to end up with a lot of defects like this. Uh, typically, the problem of tin whiskers was uh, um, in 2005, the Millstone nuclear generating plant in Connecticut observed um, that is in USA observed um, a shutdown of its plant because um, there is a steam pressure line which short circuited and this was defected, uh, this was because of a defect in one of the PCBs um, in the uh, electronics that have been used to control these uh, uh, pressure steam pressure units. So, that is a major setback and they had to replace this with uh, better PCBs. And also companies like um, um, Swatch that is a Swiss watch making company in 2006 also had to recall a, a majority of its products because of um, tin whiskers observed in the uh, PCB. So, these are information that are available uh, in the web about the defects that have been major catastrophes and I have listed here some of the major um, catastrophes that have been observed in larger scale that is the discovery shuttle, galaxy 3 shuttle satellite, patriot missile, uh, F 15 jet fighter radar all had reported um, we have in the literature about defects caused by tin whiskers in printed circuit boards. So, this uh, information has to be um, keenly observed when we are working with um, lead free materials especially tin based. Now, we look at soldering process using tin lead, tin and lead free materials. We have seen with tin, now we look at tin lead and others. Tin lead eutectic melts at 183 that is the composition of tin lead at 63.37, tin 63 percent, lead 37 percent, the eutectic temperature uh, is 183 C which is the lowest of tin lead alloys. Now, as per the phase diagram of tin lead, the eutectic composition of tin lead is 62.38, but impurities like bismuth and uh, antimony which are always present in small quantities in these materials. Um, hence, the common terminology 
that is used to describe this uh, eutectic composition is 6337 rather than 6228 um, 38 but there is hardly much difference in properties between 6337 and 6238 so uh, for all purposes we'll talk about 6337 percentages of tin and lead at the eutectic temperature the alloy has the maximum tensile strength uh, shear strength is good impact strength is good and resistance to fatigue and creep or crack has been um, in favor of using 6337 alloy now tin lead silver eutectic has been used for a long time and especially for surface mount device assembly so which means you are using a small percentage of uh, typically about 2 percent of silver is used to improve the wetting of the solder uh, joint okay silver also provides a grain boundary barrier for intermetallic growth uh, which uh, sometimes has been considered um, harmful for the solder joint and uh, the melting point has been lowered by about 4 degrees so typically from 183 you can go up to 179 uh, if you go to tin lead silver uh, composition of alloy for surface mount device application in lead free solders tin silver copper is used okay um, very popular where the copper percentage is only about 0.5 to 1 percent and silver will be around 5 percent in the above ternary mixture that is the tin silver copper ternary mixture silver and copper do not react much they react with tin separately to form intermetallic phases okay like ag3 sn or cu6 sn5 which are found uh, in literature to strengthen the alloy by building resistance to stress or uh, fatigue or uh, stress induced crack or creep which means the reliability of this system is um, definitely much better compared to uh, other systems. So, we are now looking at alternatives to tin lead ok. So, we talk about tin lead, tin alone is not recommended, tin lead is not recommended because of legislations. So, we are now looking at tin silver copper alloy, there are other alloys also which we will be discussing shortly as alternatives to uh, tin lead material. So, in the next class we will look at other materials for tin lead and uh, we will also discuss in detail about how to use thermal profiling for your assembly. I will also work out um, online how you can look at a particular situation of a substrate, various components, solder paste material and arrive at a good thermal profile for a system.